Uh, at one point in time, you may not remember this, I didn't know you. For, for, for some of you, that was a shock. You know, there was a day I didn't know you. There was a day you didn't know me. And we were what at that point? We were strangers. We were, we didn't grow up in the same neighborhoods. Uh, we're all here from, where are the states? What states are you from? Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, Tennessee, Pennsylvania. You're all from all over the place, right? I'm from Maryland. But I came here through Delaware and Connecticut and Arizona. So, but there was a time when we met and you probably looked at me and said, he's weird. He's different. And the, we're gonna talk about a, a very unique person who was strange. He was odd. What makes somebody strange or odd? They're different, they're not like you. They look different. They sound different, they dress different, they act different, they eat, they eat sauerkraut with their turkey on Thanksgiving. I mean, that's what we do. We're different. People from Baltimore. I mean, I, I was in California, I was in Southern California at a conference with thousands of people. And you know, you just sort of mingle around and at lunch, you know, it's a, a buffet, you get your thing, you sit down with all these strangers, right? And I don't know how it came up, but we were talking about being thankful, and I mentioned Thanksgiving, and one guy said, and we have sauerkraut with our turkey at Thanksgiving. So I turned to him and what did I say? You're from Baltimore. Out of all these thousands, he said, yeah. And then it was an instant connection. You know, when we meet new people, we all are looking for that connection. Because we meet new people all the time, right? Some of them stick, right? Some of them stick like a post-it note. Right? right? What's, What's a, po a po you know, how a post-it post note sticks? Stick? How's that stick? It's glue, but does it really, is it like, you know, is it like, uh, and loosely, all you gotta do is pull it gently. It's not like, you know, other kinds of tape, right? It's not permanent. But there are other people, it just seems like you connect. And, when, when you meet, meet new people, what, do, what are we supposed to do with that? And here is a case we're gonna look at in the book of Acts, uh, in chapter eight, where God sends a stranger, and a really strange, there are strangers, and then there are strange strangers, right? There are people that are so far out there, as my uncle would say. Do you know what it means when somebody's out there? What does it mean? They're like me. <laughs> when somebody's out there, they're really different, right? Anybody here see the movie Jesus Revolution? Was Lonnie out there? You know, with the long hair, hey, this house has got a great vibe. You know, he was, even for the hippie, he was out there somewhere. And God says, there are times when I want to send you to somebody who's out there. And he did that to Philip. God, uh, angel from the Lord came to Philip. And what's, what is this? What does the angel say? Go south. Okay, come to Florida, right? Go south. He says, go south to the road. But what kind of road? So is this, a, is this I-4? No. No. You see this? You can see it. Let's see if I use this. 
See that there? That's a road. Okay, back then, there, were, there was no asphalt, there was no concrete. The road was like some guy, some, it's where people used to go, and you know, it was easy because there was less stuff, and then eventually somebody would kick the stones out of the way and make a little path. That's a road, the desert road. And it goes down from Jerusalem, which is the, the big city, to Gaza. That's like saying, go down, from Winter Haven to Onam. You all been to Onam? You been to Onam? It's a flashlight. It's a flashing light, you know, and there's a railroad track, and there's one or two out of business gas stations. You know, it says, go there. You know, God says, go. And what else does he say? Does he tell them why? Does he tell them where? He says, go on the road. He doesn't give them an end destination, does he? He doesn't say, you know, go over to Lakeland. He says, just get on the road. And that was enough. He doesn't also say the who or the why. He says, there's a journey I want you to go on. And Philip, being obedient enough and having enough faith, what does he do? He starts out, he goes. And along the way, what happens? He met an Ethiopian, but not just any Ethiopian. What, what, what kind of Ethiopian was he? He was a eunuch. You all know what a eunuch is? Unfortunately, yes. Do you ever see when on animals they take off the male testicles? That's a eunuch, except it's not an animal, it's a guy, okay? And this was a fairly common thing. It's not something I think I would have gotten in line for, but it was, it was sort of common in those days for people who of high positions. It was to show that they were going to be dedicated. Uh, and so he, this uh, eunuch, he wasn't just a eunuch, he was, an important official. So in the government, where was he? He was pretty high up. And these, uh, the Kandake, which is the queen of the Ethiopians, she was a person of power. She, you know, she had land, she had authority, responsibility. She was sometimes called the queen mother. She was a ruler, an administrator. So this is the guy who was in charge of her money. That's, a, that's an important job, isn't it? Because as Deep Throat said, follow the money. The money is important, so he had a lot of responsibility. So, and he talks about the man had gone up to Jerusalem. Why? To worship. This Ethiopian eunuch came from Ethiopia. You know where Ethiopia is, right? South of Egypt. Okay? He came all the way. Now remember, there are no interstates. There are no Ubers. There is no bus service. There are no airplanes. How did you get from south of Egypt to Jerusalem? walk or maybe a, a cart or a camel but it was slow it, it you didn't get there you know it's like you you get impatient you say man you know i i had to stand at a red light you know what would happen if they had a jackknife camel uh, accident you know what would happen but he went there he's an ethiopian and he's a eunuch. Not two, not two things you would necessarily say, well, there's a worshiper of God, would you? But he was. There were a number of people, Jews, who had left and were down in Ethiopia. Perhaps he was Jewish by heritage. 
We don't know. But what we do know is he was way far away. And God was calling this guy from far away to himself. He came to worship. And they were, where did they worship? At the temple. That's why you see here, you know, he came to the temple to worship. I mean, we get in the car and drive how long to get here? Short time. Takes us 25 minutes. What does it take you? About the same? A little bit more? A little bit less? You know, 25 days? I don't know. That's a long, that's a long, that's a long trip to go for worship. But he did it. And we see that in the book of Zephaniah, there's prophecies about it. So from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offering. So there were prophecies about that. And maybe he's a fulfillment of that. But whatever he was, he was a person not like everybody in the neighborhood. You got anybody in your neighborhood that's a little different? You're pointing, you're pointing, they're pointing to you. You got people in your neighborhood a little different? You're pointing to him. Okay. We got some people uh, that are a little different than us because of, you know, we are, I am, you know, what everybody strives to be. You know, I am the model of what everybody wants to be. And anybody who's not like me has got to be I. We got this family not far from us. And very nice people. Very nice people. But they're odd. Odd to me. You know what's odd to me? Anybody who parks on the grave. I don't get this. You know, when you park, where do you park? Asphalt, concrete, on, you know, pavers. Dirt? No, you don't park. Dirt is not meant for parking. Dirt isn't even meant for walking. You know, because I get the bottom of my shoes dirty. No, no, no. You know, you walk, you, you park. And he has one of these 18-wheeler rigs. And it's on his front yard. You know, I mean, some people put fountains, some people put flowers. He's got this rig, you know, with a, and you know, it's clean and everything, but it's, their dog barks all the time, they're not like us, I don't get it. You know, what's wrong with them? And yet, when we lost power, and I was struggling with the generator I had, who was the first guy to walk across the street to help him? This weird guy. But he wasn't weird anymore. You know, we look, you know, because they're weird because they're not like us. And Philip sees this guy who's not like him. He's from, he's from Ethiopia. Now, you know, I don't know if his bumper sticker said, hey, be friendly to eunuchs or whatever. You know, how did you find that out? But apparently it came out somewhere in the conversation. Maybe he had a button on, I don't know. Uh, or a tattoo on his arm. I, it doesn't matter. That's who this guy was. And he didn't let that stop him. And uh, he comes up. And he says, he's on his way home. He's sitting in a chariot. This guy's got some bucks, OK? He's not walking. He's in a chariot. And if you're in a chariot, what do you got? You got a couple of horsepower engine in front, right? OK, pulling it. And you got people who are taking care of that, right? So you know, you've got you to be pretty powerful. You know, he's got lots of bucks. He's got lots of power. And he's sitting in his chariot, and what is he doing? He's reading the book of Isaiah. What does that tell us about him? He knows about God. He knows how to read. He's got education. 
And this is more that says, talks about his money. Normal people back in these days didn't have the scrolls because they were hand done. It was just too expensive to have them. So he was educated, he was wealthy, and he's reading, and Philip is observing all this from a ways away, and God the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So what does Philip do? He doesn't go, he runs. He runs up, and he heard the man reading Isaiah. He heard, he listened, he was close enough. And listen to what Philip does. First of all, what doesn't Philip do? He doesn't pontificate. He doesn't say, you're strange, so you gotta learn from me. He doesn't give him a track. He doesn't give him the four spiritual laws, nothing wrong with all of that. He doesn't give him a QR code to shoot with his phone to be taken to a website. What does Philip do? He asks a question, right? He asks a question. And what's the question? Do you get it? Do you understand? You're a stranger and you're reading something from, from the Jewish culture, the Jewish religion, that's kind of interesting, but do you really get it? Do you understand? It's a fair question. It's like, I'm from Baltimore, so people call me up and say, how do you make crab cakes? Okay, that makes sense because I'm from Baltimore. I got it, and I got the best recipe. I don't care what's on the internet, call 1-800-CHESTER. I will give you the lowdown on how to make it. Yeah. What was a different language? Very good, because the scriptures were written in, back then were written in Hebrew. So he's reading Hebrew. Now that's an interesting question. He was reading Hebrew. I wonder, was he saying Hebrew? Because it says he was reading. So we're just, maybe, was he reading aloud? We don't know. But he was, I'm sorry? He had to be reading aloud. Why? Because he said he knew because he heard he knew he was reading. Yeah, very good. He had his hearing aids turned on. Yeah, good observation. You see, this is so exciting to me, because what are you doing? You're, you're paying attention, you're participating, which just excites me. No, you're learning for yourself. You're reading, you're picking it apart. This is, this is the way you study the Bible. You don't study the Bible and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you look at it, you go at it, and you pull out of it. And that's what he's doing here. He says, he, and he invited him. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And th this is, you know, he was willing, Philip was willing to ask the question, but Philip was prepared. Philip knew what the passage was. He knew what it meant. And that's why he, could, he didn't say, gee, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I asked because maybe I could be of help. That's why Paul says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. Philip's life was seasoned with salt. Now, when you season with salt, what do you immediately think of? Add flavor, when? When the t on the table, right? That's when we think, you know, just before I jammed that big hunk of protein in my face is when I put the salt on. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when you're preparing the food to be seasoning it. Last night, I did some uh, chicken thighs on the grill. And when did I put the seasoning on? Before, I, before we cooked it. So that when it comes to the table for Marianne, it's seasoned. 
when it talks about seasoning our conversation, our words, that's not at the end with the salt on the table. This is when the meal's being prepared, when you and I are reading the Bible on our own, when we're in study groups, when we're working through it, so that when we get out to the people that God sends us to, it's already seasoned because it was baked in. I made fajitas, uh, I made pork fajitas one night for Cinco de Mayo. And uh, the way I make it is I get these pork steaks uh, from the shoulder and uh, I, get, I make my own fajita seasoning. And before I cook it, I sprinkle it on pretty heavily and I press it into the meat. And then I flip it over and I sprinkle it some more and I press it in and I let it sit there. And then I eventually slowly cook it. It comes out really tender. And the season, where are those seasonings now? They're baked in. They're baked in. That's the way we are to season our conversation with salt. It's salt that's part of the cooking process. So Philip asked the, this Ethiopian eunuch, I wish we knew a name because I say Ethiopian eunuch, it just go, doesn't roll off the tongue. But anyway, he says, the Ethiopian eunuch is just good enough to say, how can I know unless someone helps me? What a guy! What a guy! Yeah, he's so honest and open, he says, I don't know everything. How rare is that kind of bird? Really rare, right? Oh, I got it wired. And if I don't know, I can figure it out. You know, one of the games we play while we're watching television is, you know, these actors will come on and say, I remember them from somewhere. You ever see that? You see their face, you hear their voice. I remember them. where? It's like, I get out the phone. And, you know, I got to look up the episode, look at the cast, find the character, find their real name. Go, you know, it's not. I can't admit I don't know. I got to look it up. But he says, I don't know. How can I unless someone explain it to me? Someone explains. And then he says, hey, Bubba, come on in. Come on up into this cart or whatever that he's in. Come on in and show me how to do it. So, and this is the passage he's reading. It's, it's actually from Isaiah 53, maybe it's familiar. He was, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb, as a lamb before it shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. That, that, that's, a, that's a passage. He's reading that and he, he's wondering, he thinks to himself, he says, tell me, please, who's he talking about? Is, he, is Isaiah talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? Is he talking about someone else? He's asking and he's ready to listen. He's asking and he's ready to listen. So, now we understand why God sent him on a road without a destination. Was for this conversation. So then Philip began at that very passage of scripture. And what did he do? He didn't talk about the politics of the day, did he? He didn't ask him whether he was red or blue, politics conservative, Republican, Democrat, liberal. He didn't ask any of that. He didn't ask whether he was rich or poor. He said, 
he began and he talked about the good news of Jesus. So what is the good news of Jesus? He loves us. He's our Savior. He wants us to live with him forever. He's everybody's Savior. Even you people, strange as you are, from Ethiopia. Everybody. And part of the good news about Jesus is, you know, he, he may or may not understand. You know, the guy went to, went to the temple. And what did you do at the temple? You prayed, and what else did you do? You give money, you offer sacrifices, right? And then you're done, right? No. What do you do? You come back again to do what? Same thing. And then you come back the next year, and what do you do? Another sacrifice, another offering. You're never done, right? You're never done correct. Hey, the good news of Jesus, part of it is that God paid it for you. He did it once and for all, and that you can now receive it and be his son and his daughter. Even though, as a eunuch, you may not think of yourself as a son because of the damage that's been done to you. So they were traveling along the road, and they came to some water. And what's this guy say? Look, it's, it's, this isn't rocket science. What's stopping me from being baptized? Right then and there. He didn't have to go home to get his swimsuit. He didn't have to go get his flippers. He, did, he said he he's, knows who Jesus is. Why can't I be baptized right now? It could have, yeah. It could have, you know, and there could have been this back and forth. It could have been this back and forth. I was on a plane once. I keep talking about being on planes. But I was on this plane ride once, uh, and this guy sits next to me. And I look at his brief, because I'm nosy. Did you know I'm nosy? I am nosy. Some people say, oh, no, you're just observing. No, I'm nosy. I stick my nose in. I read. When you, if there's a piece of paper down there upside down, I'm reading it upside down because I want to know. Yeah, I'm nosy. So I look at this guy's briefcase, and I see the company he works for. And it says... Campus Crusade for Christ. Are you familiar with them? So I say, and I do what I do best. You know what that is, right? No, play dumb. I can play dumb like there's no tomorrow. And so we start this conversation. We both got upgraded to first class, so you know who's a good guy and I'm a good guy, because you only need good people up in first class. And so I say, yeah, I'll get his name. And so I say, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't help but notice. On your briefcase, what's the organization you work for? And he said, Campus Crusade for Christ. And I said, you know, I've been traveling around a lot, and I've heard of lots of different kinds of organization names. But I gotta tell you, that's the weirdest one I've ever met, I've ever heard. What in the world do you all do? And so he said, Well, you know, we're trying to reach people for Jesus. Reach people for Jesus? I said to him, Why? Why do people need Jesus? And he goes on to tell me why people need Jesus, because we're all sinners. And I said, wait a minute. Who's a sinner? He said, we all are. I said, are you calling me a sinner? And he said, with respect, yes, because I'm a sinner too. And Jesus died for us. Well, he died, okay, he died. What's the deal? Well, he rose from the dead. I said, you really believe that stuff? He said, yeah. 
And then he told me his story of how he came to faith. I said, well, that's all very interesting, but does it mean anything to me? He said, well, you need to receive Jesus. I said, well, how do I do that? And he told me I needed to admit I was a sinner, that, I, that Jesus had died for me, and I needed to receive him, and that he would be my Lord and Savior. I said, so you're expecting me to do that? You think I need this Jesus? He said, yes, you do. I said, you've been very patient with me. I'd like to give you a gift. And he was like, uh-oh. He thought I was going to buy him a drink or something. I don't know. So I said, and I told him my story of how I came to faith, about how I was a I wasn't a sinner. I was a sinner. And I came to faith in Christ. You see, that moment, that exchange brings people together. There's nobody that you'll become closer to than like Philip. Even though this Ethiopian eunuch is strange as the day is long, had almost nothing in common with him, and yet Philip doesn't keep quiet because of that. He talks, and he says, where can I go? Let's get baptized. And so he says, sure. So they stop, he gives the order to the chariot, they went down in the water, Philip baptizes him. Right then and there. The message of Jesus is so life altering. Sometimes we might feel uneasy about sharing faith. Sometimes we might feel uneasy about it because they say, well, you know, it's like playing cards. Just get another card, put your faith. No. Jesus says, throw all your cards away and have a new life. And sometimes we try to soft sell them. Philip didn't. He said, let's be baptized right now, right now. So they go in and he baptizes them. And then when they come out of the water, take, Philip goes away and the eunuch didn't see him anymore. But what did the, what did the eunuch do? He went on his way. Why? He had the indwelling Holy Spirit. He was changed. The trip that he made to Jerusalem was now complete for all eternity because Jesus paid, made the sacrifice. Rather than going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down it was Jesus did it. It was done. He was rejoicing. He was changed. And, yes. That's true. Very true. Well, if you take that is a really good uh, observation because if you take a look at the day of Pentecost, and where those people are from, they're from where? All over. And God dropped a bomb on the world because those people eventually went home. And where they went, a church sprung up. The Ethiopians have a long, long history of Christian, of Christian experience. They're called the Ethiopian Coptics. It's, it's sort of like Greek Orthodox, but they have a long, 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 long history, and they trace it back to this guy, this nameless guy. He went back and, and shared it, you know. And, and I think about this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch. You know, some people say last words are important. You know, his, he went on his way rejoicing. Okay, that's the last words we read about this guy. But back a few uh, sentences before, we have the last words that he said that are recorded. Do you remember what they were? 
What stands in the way? What stands in the way of me being baptized? What stands in the way? You know, the, the last word. You know, why go to Jerusalem? Offer sacrifices, pay tithes. You know, there's now nothing that stands in the way. The reason why this question is important it's because of the uncomfortable topic and word about him being a eunuch. You see, he went up to Jerusalem to worship, but he really couldn't because he was a eunuch. There's an Old Testament uh, law that says no eunuch is to enter the congregation of God. Eunuchs. Men who had either deformed uh, genitals or things of that nature were not allowed to worship. Now I'm going to show you a video about what the temple looked like so I can make this point. So you see this video. You see this little wall right there? That's what's called the dividing wall. And you'll see there's little openings. So in this area, away from the temple, where, where women could be, where the Gentiles could be, uh, but once you went through that opening, you had to be clean. And there were even, there were uh, signs uh, carved in stone at those openings. And it says, hey, if you go in here, in, inside of there, you're not going, you're going to be killed, and it's going to be on your own head. And you, and you might, might be thinking, thinking to yourself, well, why would God make such a rule? Because God is holy. God is perfect. What kind of sacrifice, what were the lambs supposed to be? Pure, perfect, without physical, you know, physical problems, blemishes. And this guy wasn't that way, was he? We don't know whether it was done to him. We don't know whether he chose it. The answer is, it doesn't matter. You see, because there was nothing he could do to fix it, right? There's nothing, there's no repair, there's no surgery. There's no anything. Not only that, there was nothing he could do to remove it. He couldn't, you know, undo what had been done to him. And maybe you think about your life. You say, you know, there are certain things that have happened to me. You know, maybe not that, but there are certain things in this life I can't do anything about the fix. You know, maybe I tried, maybe I've worked at it, but there are certain things like this unit you can't undo. There are certain things in this life you can't undo. And God doesn't say, you're no longer worthy. God says, I've made a way for you. I've made a way for you. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for just the perfect people. No, he died for people like you and like me. All screwed up. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, what did he say? He looked at him, coming towards him, and says, what? Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Not a lamb, but what? The Lamb, the one and only. This is it. This is the end of the line. He, it, this may be the most important thought in all of history, in all of the world. It's not like a Chinese menu, you know, you got all these things to choose from. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And remember that the temple and that wall Paul talks about this in Ephesians, this wall, because Paul says, 
For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace, who made the two groups one and has what? Destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall. That wall that was there to separate Jew from Gentile, gone. In Jesus Christ, there is no rich, there's no poor, there's no slave, there's no free, there's no male, there's no female. We're all his children. He breaks down the wall that separates us from him. And what separates us from one another. He's an Ethiopian. On top of that, he's a eunuch. You know, there are certain people who've got certain kind of paths that you just want to stay away from. I have a dear friend who's now uh, died during the pandemic. I met when we were planting a church. And he came, he would walk in, we met at a school, okay? He walked in, you know, to the lobby of the, you know, the front doors of the school. And you know what he did? He just went and backed up against the wall. And sort of hit. Just eventually, he started to come out. He would sit in the last row, and he wouldn't talk to me. And you could see fear in this guy's eyes. Eventually, I got to know him a little bit, gently, which is hard for me. I'm like, hey, let's... no, it had to be slow and patient with him. So I, I asked him, I said, uh, and he started coming to our small group where he was a little more comfortable. I said, what gives? I, I, I'm really interested in you and want to show, but I want to understand a little bit more about, because you've told us you're scared. What, why? And he told me his story. I'm not going to repeat it all, but I'm just going to say that something happened to him in a church. And that took his life down a terrible road. He thought, if this is what Christians are like, I want none of it. And he moved down. Eventually went, moved to Las Vegas, got involved with the sex trade, contracted AIDS. And then he came back here to help take care of his mom and dad, his stepdad. And it was out of that kind of background, but he, he was so broken that he was willing to dip his toe into the water to say, I, he, he knew he was broken, okay? He knew it. And he took all these pills and everything. And he was a good friend. But once I heard what he had, I wanted to back, I, I, I confess, I am not proud. I wanted to back away. Because I thought, what if he sneezes? What if I shake his hand? You know, all the things in your head. But it's like, he's a stranger. I was a stranger. Remember we sang those hymns about the blood. We said, you know, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We got the only solution, friends. And the only thing that's stopping our neighbors and friends from hearing it is us keeping our yaps shut, if you'll excuse me for putting it that way. We're the problem. 
There are people out there desperate, dying to hear. If Jesus broke down the wall for us, we need to break down the walls with one another, with the people that are different than us. And that means who goes to who? Who went to the eunuch? Did the eunuch go to Philip? No. What did happen? God sent Philip to the eunuch. And Philip was just honest enough to go. Didn't ask for an explanation. Didn't ask for an itinerary. Didn't ask for a checklist. He just went. So as you go this week, think about it. Every time you go out, there are, there are people you're going to meet. Maybe, just maybe, they need a word of encouragement. Maybe they need to know that their sins can be totally forgiven once and for all. We're the ones. We got the message. And go out. Let's, let's give it. Let's give it. Let's not hold anything back. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I thank you that you didn't hold anything back. That when it came to loving us, you just gave everything your best. You gave us your son, Jesus. And it was in him our desperate payment was made once and for all. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And so, just like this Ethiopian eunuch went out with joy, let's leave here with joy. And let's spread a little bit of that and share it with the people around us. They're looking to catch it. Let's be giving it. In your name, amen.